Good day, Grade Tens. Welcome to this lesson on um, physical science and the atom. I apologize for being late. Um, I actually had a little bit of a um, technical hitch and um, I apologize for that. So we are back and we're in business. I just need to somehow get rid of that. I'm going to move it over to there. Um, Okay, so there we go. So anyway, so basically we are talking about the atom. I'm sorry about that. Um, I just explained for those of you who are technically inclined, I usually use two laptops and broadcast through the second laptop. The second, the second laptop that I normally broadcast through has had a technical glitch. So now today I am broadcasting through one laptop, which is quite exciting for me because I've never really done that before. Um, but um, it does mean that you have this little scap window in the corner that I don't really know how to get rid of, but we'll worry about that later. Um, but it shouldn't interfere. So anyway, welcome to our next lesson in science in grade 10. Um, in this lesson, we're going to carry on with our development of the atomic model, and then we're going to move on to the structure of the atom, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so let's move on. So I don't know if you remember, but we were talking. Let me just see if I can get rid of this. Let me see if I can get rid of this scrap thing, shall we? Can I? Let me just do this. Ha! Okay, awesome. Oh no, it's back. Okay, sorry. You're just gonna have to learn to ignore it. Okay, I'll move it right up in the corner there, so it should be other way. Okay, so I don't know if you remember, but we were talking about Rutherford in the last lesson, and what we what we said was that that Rutherford did this cool experiment where he basically took um, a an alpha particle, which is a really big particle, and it's a positively charged particle, and he shone it through this really thin gold foil. In fact, it's so thin that the analogy for him was that he said that it was the equivalent of taking a huge screen of tissue paper, huge screen of tissue paper, and then shooting a cannonball through it. Because at the time, Rutherford thought that the atoms were solid little balls, okay? So he actually set this experiment up to demonstrate to his students that you could actually see atoms even though they were so small that we can see them with the naked eye. However, what they discovered was that most of the positive charge bullets passed right through the gold atoms without changing the course and without messing with gold foil. So in other words, there was no hole. He expected to be a big hole over here. They expected to be a big black hole over here. But, or in fact, not even black hole, just a big hole. Okay, but what they discovered was most of the, the alpha particles, what they call the positive bullets, traveled through here without actually messing, without actually breaking the tin foil. And then there were some that actually reflected or were deflected, okay? And he knew that positive charges repel positive charges. So what he concluded, and I just want to do this because we did actually talk about this in the last lesson, he concluded that the gold atoms in the sheet were mostly open space. They couldn't be solid because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to pass through it without actually making a hole in it, right? Secondly, he said the atoms were therefore not the pudding filled with the positively charged material, right? He concluded that an atom had a small, dense, positively charged center. So it had, and the reason he said that it had to have a small, dense, positively charged center was because of some of these Alpha particles were reflected. I apologize for this. I don't know why it's doing this. And some were deflected. And some were deflected. Okay. So he called the center of the atom the nucleus. And the tiny, and he said that the nucleus was tiny compared to the atom as a whole. Okay. So those were Rutherford's conclusions. And guys, I need to tell you, I've expressed this in the last lesson. I said, please remember how to do this, you need to be able to draw and label and explain using this drawing what Rutherford's conclusions were or how they came about. They love asking this. Okay, let's move on. 
Rutherford reasoned that all of the atoms, positively charged particles, were contained in the nucleus. Okay, which was he was right about. Okay, and he also he said the negative charged particles were scattered outside the nucleus around the atom's edge. So those were his basic conclusions, as well as the fact that the nucleus was very small compared to the size of the atom, and that most of the atom was free space. Then, in 1913, there was this Danish scientist by the name of Niels Bohr. And I say it like this because actually this man was very impressive. And the Bohr model of the atom is what we base our atom on these days. Okay, there's a little bit more complicated when you get to university. It is quite a bit more complicated, but for our purposes, okay, this is what we use. We use the Bohr model. And he said, Electrons move in definite orbits around the nucleus, much like the planet's circle, the sun, okay? These orbits or energy levels are located at certain distances from the nucleus. So he said, okay, fine, here is a nucleus, and there is an orbital, okay, where we will find some electrons. And then a bit further away, there's another orbital where we'll find some electrons. And then finally, there might be, and it, it go, not finally, it goes on and on and on for as many energy levels that that atom has. Okay, so that was pretty impressive because up to now, people had managed to get from being a solid little ball to the fact that there was a positive nucleus and maybe one layer of electrons, and I think I know what this glitch is. It's my computer struggling to be both the camera and the processor for this lesson. Okay, so there's nothing much I can do about it now, but for the next lesson, we will definitely have both computers back up. Okay, now the atom. So that was Niels Bohr's model, and that's what we're going to be talking about when we talk about the structure of the atom. So an atom, and this is a carbon atom, is made up of a center of a nucleus, okay? This bit here is called the nucleus, and the nucleus has got protons and neutrons in it, and the electrons are found in orbitals around the nucleus. So you've got the protons. The protons are heavy, they are positively charged, okay? They are found in the nucleus. The neutrons have the same mass as the protons. So they have the same mass, okay? But they are, as their name implies, they are neutral, they are neutral. And they are also found in the nucleus. So we generally say the mass of an atom is in its nucleus. And why is that? That's because electrons are 1,840 times lighter in mass. Now, if you read a textbook, they sometimes say, oh, it's approximately 2,000 times lighter in mass. Yes, it is. It's approximately. It's exactly 1,840 times lighter in mass. It's negatively charged. Now, this is important. Even though in mass, this is 2,000 times smaller, in charge size, the charge of the electron is equal to the charge of the proton, but they're just opposite. They're oppositely charged. Okay, so the proton is positively charged and the electron is negatively charged. So they're equal in charge but opposite, which means that one proton will cancel out one electron to give a neutral atom. Okay, and they are found in orbitals, like I said, around the nucleus. So before we carry on, I just want to talk to you a bit about orbitals. Orbitals are where you are most likely to find an electron. So the definition of an orbital, it's an area in space where you are most likely to find the electrons. So the thing is that um, the th thing is that, sorry, the thing is that what you need to think of this as, as a flight path, okay? If you are traveling in an airplane and the, the pilot will say, oh, look, we're flying from Cape Town to Joburg and our path will take us over Kimberley, for example. So if you 
think about that, you will realize that there is no, it's not like a road, okay, where there is a specific tar that you must drive along, okay? It's an area in space that has been mapped out that the plane is going to fly along. Okay, so it's a flight path. So if I said to you what is a flight path, I would say that a flight path is where you're most likely to find your airplane. Right, so exactly the same with an orbital. An orbital isn't a solid line like this. An orbital, if I had to draw it, let's pretend that's the nucleus, then I would actually draw it kind of like that because it's actually called quite broad and it's where you are most likely to find your electron. In other words, your electron could do something like this. It could go from here, it could go beautifully around. Now remember this is three dimensional. All it could do is go out to the far end and then it could go, go out to the far end here and then it could go in and then go far end out here and so on and so on. So it's where you are most likely to find your electrons. Another way to think of it is if it's like, if you want to think about traffic and cars, if you want to think of it as a three lane highway, where the highway is where you're driving, that's your orbital, if you want to think of it like that. But you have a slow lane and maybe a middle lane and then a fast lane. So while you're driving along that road, okay, while you're driving along that road, you, have the option to either be in the slow lane or the middle lane or the fast lane. And if you're going on a long trip, you will know that you actually tend to swap between them depending on the other traffic, etc., etc. So that's what an orbital is. So it's not a specific road or thing in, in real life. It's just an area in space where we are most likely to find our electron. Now the periodic table, the periodic table of elements obviously gives us a lot of information and we're going to be talking about that information in a minute, but you need to understand that the periodic table um, is our basis for our reference table for understanding how the elements fit together, okay? And I'm sure you know about this Russian dude called Dmitry. Mendeleev and his name is spelled differently depending on who writes it. Some people write with an I in there, etc. Okay, he is a Russian dude and what happened was there were already people trying to fit the elements together to see if they formed a pattern. But he was the very first person that actually managed to group the elements in almost identical periodic table type pattern that we use now. And in fact, the only mistakes that he made or gaps that he left were because of atoms that or elements that hadn't been discovered at the time. So it's actually very impressive. Okay, now there are things that you need to know about this periodic table. So I'm going to label it. And what I suggest you do if you don't know these things is that you take out your periodic table and you come back and you watch and you label these things. Okay, so the first group are called your alkali metals and your second group are called your alkali earth metals Darn it. earth metals okay so alkali metals are metals that when they're dissolved in water form an alkaline solution Okay, and alkaline earth metals are, are exactly the same, but they are found in the earth's crust, which is why they're called alkali earth metals. These dudes here are called the transition elements or transition metals, depending on who you're talking to, but we will call them the metals. Okay, group three, four, and five, and six don't have fancy names, but group seven are called the halogens. And group eight are called the noble gases. Okay, and you need to know that. Also what you need to know is that the columns in a periodic table are called groups. So the columns in the periodic table are called groups. And the rows of the periodic table are called periods. 
So in other words, does this period one, even though it's only got two elements in it, period two, period three, period four, period five, etc. And then the way the groups count is a bit interesting. It is group one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the reason we have skip a few is because of the fact that um, these transition metals are special and it's to do with how they bond and their valence electrons. So the way that we count are one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When you get to university, you won't be skipping the few, okay? But at the moment, that's what we do. Okay, so now let's talk about the information that our periodic table can give us. So if you look at a certain block on the periodic table. So if I go back, there's my carbon and all I've done is enlarged it, okay? And you can see there's a carbon six here and it says it's carbon and there's 12.011. Now, obviously this is not what your periodic table is going to look like when you use it in the testing exams because the first thing first is that it's not in color, it's black and white. Secondly, it doesn't give you the names of the elements. So you guys need to know the names. Right, but it does give you what's called the relative atomic mass and the atomic number. So what is this giving you? It gives you C is the symbol for carbon. Six is the atomic number, which indicates the number of protons. Now, if I said to you, what defines an element? This is it. It's the number of protons in the nucleus. Okay. An atom can have different number of electrons and then become an ion. An ion, I-O-N, an ion is an atom that has either lost or gained electrons, right? It can also lose or gain neutrons and then it becomes an isotope. Okay, so atoms with different mass, but the same number of protons, is an isotope, right? Like you might have heard of carbon-14 dating and things like that. Means that it's got 14 neutrons in it instead of 12, all right? Or 14 nucleons in it. But the number of protons tells you what element it is okay and if it's got six protons then it is definitely carbon because as of at the moment we don't know of any other way of changing the number of protons in an element without changing its chemical properties so it's matched okay but also if the if it's an atom and it's neutral it equals the number of electrons and is represented by the letter Z. 12 is the relative atomic mass, and it says 12.011, and I'll explain it now. This is the mass number. It indicates number of protons and neutrons, number of protons and neutrons, and is represented by the letter A. Now, why do I say that this is 12, and you can see 12.011 here? So we're going to speak about this a little bit later, but let me just explain to you a little bit more, because, oops, sorry. Um, it says relative atomic mass, and the reason it's relative, it's because it's actually an average, an average. Okay, forget for a minute that you've got carbon, and let's think about hydro, okay, now let's work with carbon. So what happens is that there are some atoms that have got different numbers of neutrons, neutrons okay? So let's say that 99.99%, 99.99% of carbon have got 12 protons and 12 neutrons in it, okay? Well, six protons and six neutrons, which make 12, okay? But there might be a 0.01% of carbon that has got 14 nucleons in it, made up of six protons and eight neutrons, okay? So do you agree that those masses are gonna be different? Because remember that all the mass comes from the nucleus. So if we had to find the average of this, we would have to go, and I will show this to you later, but basically we're gonna go 12 times 99.99 
plus 14 times 0 0.001, 0 0.01, and then you divide it by 100 because it's 100%. And you end up with a number that looks similar to this, which is 12.011. So basically what we're saying is that the reason this isn't perfect is because there's this thing called isotopes, which are atoms which have the same number of protons, but they have different number of neutrons. Okay, same number of protons, different number of neutrons, so that they have a different mass, but because they've got the same number of protons, they still act the same chemically. Okay, so now let's look at this example. Let's just see what we can work out here. Do you agree that we're saying that Na is the so symbol for sodium? The atomic number, the atomic number is 11 which means the number of protons equals the number of electrons, which equals 11. Okay, sorry. And then the other thing that you can realize is that this here is the relative atomic mass. So if we rounded it up, do you agree that the relative atomic mass is 23? But that is the number of protons and what? Protons and what? Protons and neutrons. So if we know that the number of protons is 11 because of the atomic number, do you agree we can say, well, then it's pretty obvious that the number of neutrons has to be 23 minus 11, which is going to be 12. So we can see, therefore, that for this sodium, the number of protons is 11, the number of neutrons is 12, okay, and that there is all the information we can get from here. Right. Now let's talk about aluminium 3 plus, okay. Aluminium 3 plus means that it has lost electrons. How many electrons has it lost? It's lost three electrons. Why? Because, oh, this pen's driving me insane. Because the fact that it has, let's look at the periodic table, yeah, is aluminium. Now we're saying it is aluminium 3 plus, which means it's gained three electrons, I mean, lost three electrons. So it's lost that one, it's lost that one, it's lost that one. So do you agree that it's now structurally the same as neon? So aluminium 3 plus has the same number of electrons as neon. The same number of electrons as neon. So why do we form aluminium 3 plus? Well, every element and every atom wants to be like a noble gas atom. Noble gases don't participate in any other reactions with anybody else. And the reason for that is because the energy levels are full. The energy levels are completely full. So if I take my aluminium, okay, it wants to have an energy level that's full. It can either lose three electrons to become like neon, or it can gain five electrons to become argon. Now what you need to remember, and I'm going to say this every time we do this part of the stuff, it takes the same amount of energy to gain an electron as it does to lose an electron, exactly the same amount of energy. So my options for aluminium is either to gain one, two, three, four, five electrons to become like argon, or I can lose three to become like neon. So that is why aluminium is very happily going to change into aluminium three, oh, I hate this, aluminium three plus. Aluminium 3 plus. And the reason for that is because it's trying to become noble. Right. So we've now spoken about the fact that aluminium 3 plus has lost electrons. And let's just talk a little bit more about aluminium. Do you agree that the number of protons is 13? That means this number of electrons is also 13. Okay, but now aluminium 3 plus the number of electrons is going to be three less. And so now it's going to have 10 electrons. But it still has, it still has 13 protons. 
because you can't remove the protons without it changing to a different element. Okay. Now let's talk about O2 minus. What do you think this means? And now what is the atomic number? Okay. So let's look at your oxygen. Now we're talking about O2 minus. So do you agree that this is two more electrons negative than oxygen? So what does it become? It has gained two electrons. It has gained two electrons. Okay. If it has gained two electrons, do you agree that it's going to be structurally similar to neon? Okay, because yeah, it's going to have six electrons. If it gains two electrons, it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same as neon. So basically, it is trying to be an isotope. So, exactly the same as what I've just said. What do you think this means? We've spoken about the fact that it's got extra two electrons. Now, what is the atomic number of the neutral oxygen atom? Remember, the atomic number is a number of protons. And does that ever change? No. So, that is still eight. How many electrons does O2 minus have? Well, it's got the eight plus these two electrons. That becomes ten. Still, the number of protons is 8, and the number of neutrons, well, this rounds off to 16, so therefore that is 8 as well. Right, so we've kind of spoken about isotopes and a relative atomic mass already, but what I really want to do now is just get into more detail with respect to the isotopes and the, and the relative atomic mass and talk about definitions and what you guys need to know. So... The chemical properties of an atom depend on two things. They depend on the number of protons and the number of electrons. Chemical properties are not affected by the number of neutrons. Okay, chemical properties not affected by the number of neutrons. Okay, which means that the isotopes are going to stay in the same place on the periodic table. We're not moving the atoms around the periodic table. If we did that, then the periodic table would be useless to us. What we're doing is saying that the chemical properties, how easily it burns or dissolves or melts, or whatever, that is dependent on the number of protons and the number of electrons. So you need to know this definition of isotopes, please. You really do need to know this definition. And the definition it states that the isotopes of an element have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. Okay? In other words, they have the same atomic number Z but different number of neutrons and therefore a different atomic mass number. Different isotopes of an element will have the same chemical properties, but might vary in the stability of their nucleus, okay? So, for example, you've got chlorine-35. The atomic mass of chlorine-35 means that it's got 17 protons and 18 neutrons. You also have chlorine-37, which has got 17 protons and 20 neutrons. So, those are two examples of isotopes. So, let's again talk about the relative atomic mass because now we're actually going to look at calculating it properly. In nature, your different isotopes occur in different percentages. For example, you've got chlorine-35 makes up 75% of all chlorine atoms, while chlorine-37 makes up the remaining 25%. So, in order to work out our relative atomic mass, we need to work out the average atomic mass of these two isotopes. Let's go through it. We're going to go through the steps. Chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine-35 and chlorine-37. These occur naturally as 75% chlorine-35 and 25% chlorine-37. And the typical exam question would be calculate the average relative atomic mass of chlorine. That's a typical exam. The first thing we need to do is calculate the mass contribution of chlorine-35 
to the average rate of atomic mass. So we're saying 75% of the rate of atomic mass, 75% of chlorine is chlorine 35. So we've got 75 over 100 times by that mass of 35, which is 26.25. Ching ching. Okay. Now we need to calculate the contribution of chlorine 37. So it makes up 25%. So it's 25 over 100 times by 37 to give us 9.25. So then what we need to do is add the two values to arrive at the average rate of atomic mass. So you've got chlorine 35, which is 26.25, and chlorine 37, which is 9.25. Therefore, the rate of atomic mass of chlorine is 35.5 atomic mass units. Okay. Now we need to talk about the electron configuration. So we've already spoken about orbitals. Again, okay? we've said that electrons move around the nucleus in orbitals in different energy levels. Okay, there are four kinds of orbitals. Okay, so there's S, P, D, and F orbitals. And for you guys in grade ten, you really just have to worry about S and P orbitals. Okay. So each orbital can contain a maximum of two electrons, but that's only if they're in opposite spin. It's only if they have opposite spin. So what I want you to think of is, here is your nucleus, which has protons and neutrons in it, and then here is your orbital. Here is your orbital, okay? And what we are saying, um, okay, so what we are saying is that we've got two electrons, okay, and what is happening is that they are, have to be, if you're, sorry, the maximum of two electrons in each orbital, and what they have is that they are in opposite spin. So one might be spinning this way, and the other is spinning this way. Now, orbitals, like I said, are regions in space around the nucleus in which there is a 95% probability of finding the electron at any given time. In other words, it is where you're most likely to find your electrons. So we've spoken about that. The orbital is just where you are most likely to find your electron. Okay, right, and it's an area in space. There's no like lines in space and everything else. Okay, so now your S orbitals. Okay. Now, just let me explain what's going on here. So your S orbitals are spherical in shape, okay? In other words, and please remember whenever I'm drawing something like this, let me just go back for a second. Whenever I'm drawing something like this, obviously I can't draw it in two dimensions. You can draw it in two dimensions. So I mean, I mean, I can't draw it in three dimensions. I can only draw it in two dimensions. So you can see here that they've made an effort to make it look like a sphere by shading it, okay? And that is actually what your orbitals look like. They are three dimensional. So when I draw a little orbital, and I draw the electron going around like this, please remember that it's actually going into the page and out of the page and everything. It's doing this whole 3D bit, okay? Now, the S orbitals are spherical. Every energy level has an S orbital and they just get bigger and bigger. So this would be, for example, a 1S energy level orbital. This would be a 2S and this would be a 3S. And the nucleus is always at the center of these, like it's always at the center, but the only thing that's inside the 1s orbital is the nucleus. Yeah, we've got, if this is 2s, then this would have the nucleus and it would have this 1s orbital inside it, okay? It's like a little onion rings if you want to think of it this way, is that you've got your inside right at the beginning in front is the nucleus and then yeah, you've got your 1s, which is this dude that's now fitting inside and then you've got your 2s. In this one, which is 3s, the third energy level, it's going to have the 1s, it's going to have the 1s, it's going to have this dude here's 2s, 
and it actually has what you're gonna hey it is a 2p but you don't have to worry about that right now so that is what's looking happening inside those energy levels so you have to think of them as onion rings okay the first energy level is made up of only one s orbital okay so if you remember the periodic table it does this Okay, so it goes like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, and then like that. Okay, more or less. Okay, this here is hydrogen, and this dude here is helium. Okay, and together they are your first period, and they are your first energy level. So the first energy level has only got two atoms in it or two elements in it and it's made up of an s orbital one s orbital helium for example is on your periodic table and if we look at helium we can see that it has an atomic number of two which means that the number of protons equals two this year is the relative atomic mass and you can see from this number it is not just four so it means that there must be some helium out there that has got a little bit of a bigger number than four okay because otherwise it would have a perfect relative atomic mass of four now if we look at the p orbitals p orbitals now p orbitals are dumbbell or lobe shaped so what I need to explain to you, and this is very important because, and I feel a bit of an idiot explaining this to you because you guys probably don't think like I did. But when I was at school, for some reason, I thought the electrons, because the S orbitals, right? The electrons went around the outside of it, right? That's what I thought. So when it came to P orbitals, I stupidly, when I was at school, thought that the electrons went around the P orbitals like this because if they went around the outside of the s orbitals then obviously they went around the p orbitals like this okay but if they did that then there's a huge problem with that and what's that the nucleus is at the center here so that would mean the electron was going through the nucleus every time so effectively you'd have let me just change color okay you would have the nucleus this nucleus right and then you'd have a little electron would be coming through the nucleus and then coming along and through the nucleus every time and if the electrons traveling through the nucleus you have an atomic bomb okay so <laughs> i really wasn't thinking about that very carefully so let me explain to you what actually happens the electrons still rotate around the nucleus in an orbital circular fashion okay and I will talk to you about the 3p in a minute let's just talk about this p okay this is going up this is coming out of the page to the top and this is the bottom right but what this orbital the reason it's this dumbbell shape or lobe shape is it's saying that the electrons are most likely to be found out here and very unlikely to be found in this little bit over here okay but it doesn't mean that you're not going to get an electron that does let me just change color so you can see what i'm doing that doesn't do um, this so an electron could actually go th through here think 3d okay so it's going to come through here through there out through there then maybe back through here and then back out etc etc okay that's what they're saying they're saying that this area here if i colored in an area in space where we were most likely to find electrons we would find electrons most of them would be out here and once in a blue moon you might find an electron down here very close to it okay once in a blue moon okay so obviously then um that's one of the things about the p orbital that you need to know okay secondly you need to know that every one of these p orbitals i mean can handle only two electrons right so in other words there can only be one electron on this side and one electron on this side as they are spinning around and there are three p orbitals one for each of the axes so this here would be the x axis this is the y axis and this is the z axis actually i think that's the z and this is the x 
Okay, we'll take this as the x and that's the z-axis and that's the y. Okay, so again, you're thinking three-dimensionally. You guys have learned about x and y axis, right? You guys have done tons of x and y. If it wasn't, if you haven't done it in science, you've definitely done it in maths, where there's x and y. Now, if you think 3D, you need to go into the page and other page, so there's an axis like yeah, and that is your z-axis. So this here is the y-axis, and then it totally depends on your mood. If this is the z-axis, then this is going to be the x-axis. So you end up with three orbitals, one on each of the axes. So these electrons are going to be going out of the page, through the blue thing, and back, and out of the page, and through the blue thing, and back. These electrons, these yellow ones, are going to be doing a similar type of thing. Now, from every, from energy level to upwards, every energy level has a set of 3p orbitals. Okay, there is a set of 3p orbitals from each energy level. And remember, each orbital can only hold two electrons. Let's talk about beryllium now. Beryllium is over, no, that's boron. Let's try again. Let's talk about beryllium. Okay, let me just erase that all. Let's talk about beryllium. Okay, so do you agree that it is in the second energy level, right? Second energy level, and it's in group two. So, what do we know about it, okay? We know that if we had to draw off by diagrams, wait, let's just talk about beryllium for a minute, okay? We know that it's in group two, and it's in period two, right? So we can say, well, it's in group two and it's in period two, right? We also know that it has four protons and if it is neutral, it's gonna have four electrons. And from this number, we can see it's got five protons, five protons. Okay, approximately five protons. So there we go. But now we can actually use that information and the fact that it's in group two and period two to draw what is called an off bar diagram. And I have just run out of time. So grade tens, I would like to advise you to go and watch this video again and make sure you understand what we've learned so far about the development of the atomic model and the, and the actual atomic model. And then we will get back to carrying on with this, learning this about the structure of the atom in the next lesson. Have a great day.